whether or not they get in heaven. Most people who don't really understand the nature of salvation by grace through the finished work of Christ will conclude that salvation is works-based because we live in a works-based society. We're supposed to get promoted based on our merit, based on our contribution, based on our utility to the company. So we are programmed to be based to think in terms of working to earn something. And so many people who've never really considered the claims of Christ conclude that. That's why when we own these, in these organizations, we got to try to figure out how can I maybe connect with that person, get the opportunity to share our faith with them. And how can I influence what they're doing so that what they're doing really accomplishes something that will indeed help to advance the kingdom of God? Am I making sense? So Jesus calls Peter, James, and John, not that they would forget everything that they knew about fishing, just the object. So they would bring everything they knew about fishing into the kingdom of God and then use those skills and talents and insights and use those connections to advance God's kingdom. So we see that here in Mark chapter 1. Now we, we drop down to Mark chapter 2, verse 13, and we see now the calling as Mark records the calling of, of the disciples who become apostles to the next group. He's penetrated the commercial world of fishing in Mark 1. So now he goes and he calls Matthew. Now, we've talked about Matthew before. He was a, he was a tax collector. He was a publican. He, he was despised. He was hated. He was vilified by the Jewish people because anyone that was a tax collector was working for the Roman government. And they were exacting taxes from the people. And many of the tax collectors, if not most of them, were corrupt. They used the power that they had as members of the Roman IRS to extort money away from the people and pay out their own pockets and then pay their particular part that they paid to the government. He was hated. He was defiled. He was vilified. But he was powerful because everybody knew him. Everybody knew him that was on his tax roll that he had to collect taxes from. He had tremendous name recognition in the community. And so Jesus calls Matthew, the Bible says, and told him to leave his seat of custom, to leave his tax office, and to follow him. And Matthew rises and he follows him. Now, Mark doesn't list all of this detail, but does give us enough to see what Matthew did. Matthew understood that I've come to know the Christ, I've come to know the Savior, but I know a whole lot of folk that are lost in my profession. He didn't go to Skid Row looking for folk. He didn't go to the men's shelter looking for people. He didn't go to the women's domestic violence shelter looking for folk. No, he just looked in his, in his world. In the world that he functioned in, in the world that he worked in, he knew all of the tax collectors. And so what does Matthew do? Matthew holds a great big party. And he invites everybody that he knew that was a tax collector and that was a publican and that was as corrupt as he was because he had what they call street cred with those in the tax collecting occupation. All of us have a past, and we have credibility with some people. Sometimes the credibility is just the wrong way, all right? We have credibility as being a crook, as being a cheat, as being a swindler, and as being a chief sinner, and people know if we say we got saved, one thing we weren't, and that was a hypocrite. So sometimes people will come just out of curiosity <laughs> to find out, now, if this brother that got saved, if this sister that got saved, I got to see this for myself. And I think Matthew understood that. Matthew understood, he said, there's no way that my brothers in the IRS believe that I'm going to leave this lucrative occupation and walk away from this to follow some itinerant Hicksville preacher from Nazareth of Galilee. He says, I'm just going to throw a party so they can see it for themselves. And so his first witness was his identification with Christ. Now this is powerful because what it does, it outs Matthew. Now he can't be in no cognito in disguise. Now this is a public event. See, Christianity is personal, but it can never be private. It's personal, 
but it can never be private because it's supposed to influence everything that we do. And so what Matthew does, it helps to advance the kingdom of God, but it also helps to solidify his commitment. It helps to solidify his standing as a disciple of Christ because he has this public event. We're going to start practicing that. Matter of fact, we're going to start practicing that. Y'all agree with me? We're going to practice that. Because y'all got to pay for it. <laughs> no, but seriously, what we're going to do is every time someone makes a profession of faith, we are to throw a party. We're going to throw a party and invite everybody that they know. Get, let them send out invitations. Like we really mean, but like, like people really do parties. And then call people. And the day that they're baptized, we're going to have as many people as we can get here that they know and throw a party so that they can stand up there in their baptismal pool and give testimony before their friends publicly. I'm identifying with the Lord Jesus Christ. If they want to, they can tell how they came to Christ. And if they stand in the baptismal pool and if they stutter, I'm going to drown them right there on the spot. <laughs> Put them down in there. It'd be just like somebody preparing a big wedding, then the bride don't show up. No, no, you you go testify today. <laughs> but seriously, it is, it is a way to do evangelism in a way that is sort of natural. If this is important, if we believe a person putting a, their faith in Christ is the most important decision that they will ever make in their life, then we are to show that in a public way. You remember the story about those things that are lost, right? In Luke chapter 15. And what did Jesus say? He says there's a cosmic party in heaven over every time a sinner repents. The Lord ain't concerned nothing about Noel Divine running 65 or 70 yard touchdown. It ain't, it ain't, it ain't got nothing on the radar screen in heaven. As a matter of fact, there are no big screen TVs up there like in the bar. They ain't watching no football up in heaven. What God is watching up in heaven, God has multiple screens that all the angels are looking at, positions showing things all over the world, and every time a sinner repents and puts their faith in Christ, there's a hip hip hooray up in heaven. There's a cosmic party in heaven over one sinner that repents, more than over 99 righteous people that don't need any repentance. That's how serious it is to God. That's where God's heart is moved and God's passion stirs. It's over people hearing and responding to the gospel. So he's recruiting his labor force that will have some passion. Passion. You ought to have passion about people who you used to sin with. If they're not saved yet, you ought to have passion about them becoming saved. You know, Brother Ron Sherrod and I, we were shaken. We were shaken because I'm not sure where my brother David Neal really was with the Lord. He was a nice guy. I hope that he'd made his real commitment to Christ. But we were like brothers. We became men together. We came to West Virginia Tech together in 1963 and did some of the craziest things you ever wanted to imagine that we did. Together. As brothers, the four of us, David Neal, Sam Monroe, and Ron Sherrod. And now Sam Monroe is gone. In a very tragic situation, David Neal is gone. And Sherrod and I were sitting down up, 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 up the funeral thing, man, where did our youth go? Where did these years go? And we start calling off the names of people that we had been to school with that have left this earth. And start calling the names of others that we're not sure have they made a commitment to Christ. And it started to kind of stir our passion to say, look, we found the Lord. We are preachers of the gospel, but have we really went the extra mile to find those people that we used to sin with? Now, I ain't going to exaggerate. I ain't got drunk. I ain't never was into no drinking. because my, my people drunk enough for me, my kids, my grandkids, for everybody. So that's one. That, but, but we did some crazy stuff. And there's something about certain things that it bonds you with people for life. The experience. Having guns drawn on you over something crazy. And you escape the laugh about it. It binds you together. And so Jesus wants Matthew to use his influence and to use his passion and also to use his insight and understanding of how the tax collectors think and how.